is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Deadwood, Season 3, Episode 5, A Two-Headed Beast. In this episode, when I first heard that, I was thinking about the beast with two backs, which is what people call it when somebody is having sex. And I thought that this was going to be a weird sex episode, but it turns out that the two-headed beast is not that. I'm not sure it's necessarily the fight either, but this fight, guys, this is pretty brutal shit. This is really fun. I'm so glad Dan's okay. I was so worried. I was so worried. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Y'all, like, I wanted to be confident that Dan was going to win, but I wasn't. Because this show, it feels like the exact kind of thing that they do to have this be Dan's last episode and for him to kind of go out. I was going to say in a blaze of glory, but I feel like that's not really a fair description of what this fight would be. I think it's more to go out fighting. Uh, is how I would think they would want Dan to go. Dan's not going to get food poisoning. Dan's not going to... I don't even see Dan getting shot. I really do think this is the most Dan way to go out. And if he had died, I would not have been surprised. I just would have been really bummed. But thankfully, he did not die. Although he is suffering... (sighs) I don't even want to say PTSD. It's like, it's something more, it's, it's a combination of a trauma and a guilt and coming to terms with the way that this fight went. And I really appreciated Johnny specifically asking Al later on, like he has killed a lot of people And you've also killed a lot of people. Why is he acting like this? Like this is some new thing that he's never gone through before. We know that he has like murdered plenty of folks. And I liked Al's response to that, which is basically, first of all, we try not to do fair fights. So the fact that this was a fight that everybody went into knowing full well that this was a fight changed the whole like the the whole tone and vibe of it for him secondly he watched this dude die like it's it wasn't a quick slash of the throat it wasn't a quick stab to the heart it wasn't a quick shot to the head it was a slow death and also the fact that it was so public I don't know how much that matters to Dan, but I kind of feel like he's uh, more comfortable doing all this dirty work when it's sort of like under the under the cover of like a veneer of like, oh, who knows what happened? He just had a terrible accident, even though we all know that it wasn't an accident. And even though he's aware that we all know that we can all pretend But this is him literally beating somebody to death in the thoroughfare. That's a different proposition. And I don't know how much that matters, like I said, but I feel like it must. Um, So anyway, this fight scene, do you know what this reminded me of? Because it's, you know, two older dudes and they really make sure to show us how exhausted they get and how worn out they are. It reminded me of the fight between Sauron and and Gandalf (laughs) which is one of my favorite fight scenes of all time because it is so hard to watch because they're both like older men and they are beating the hell out of each other and when they do they make old man like whales it's like (gasps) like that kind of like terrible it is so hard to watch that scene but it's like really effective because of that so 
that's sort of what this scene evoked for me was that like both of you guys are borderline too old for this like you're just managing to pull it out but you're lucky that neither of you is is up against someone significantly younger because this wouldn't go well for either one of you um anyway i'm gonna start at the beginning here because this beginning guys we it starts off with fucking stapleton and one of size whores and she's like in the bathtub and he's talking into her tits like it's a like like it's a radio or something it is the weirdest thing i have to say i enjoy the fact that this dude is apparently like really into fuller figured women because i always appreciate a bit of representation on in that regard so we had first jack's lady that he brought with him claudia i think her name is and uh and then this woman so i'm feeling pretty like re- represented and i like that uh but the weirdness of this whole thing <sighs> sai comes in and i love this he says i'm considering being Swearingen's decided and underling will represent him in certain of our mutual transactions, would it be my seemly tact to do likewise? And Khan gives him a sort of look like, I don't know exactly what you want me to say here that's not going to get me in trouble, but I don't want that job at all. And I don't blame him because, come on. Stapleton would be so far out of his depth. This is not a smart man. This is not a man who can see more than a step ahead, if that. He needs to be held by the hand and told exactly what to do all the time. You don't want somebody like this. No, 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 no. Um, and yeah, I'd need to know my man had some discipline and appetites in fucking harness and the like. Basically, nothing could be used against him and he wouldn't be bribed or bribable, you know. Um, And Khan says, all right, so truth be told. And I have to tell you guys, I was watching this the first time on my phone and Owen interrupted me right around here and I had to press pause. And I paused right at the moment where... And I'm going to take a screenshot of this, and I think I'm going to use this as the uh, image for this episode, even though normally I use the same Deadwood banner every time. I think I may have to use this. It's Stapleton looking at Psy with almost like real fear in his eyes. And he's saying, I fucked a woman and after a long period of abstention, it seems to have sent me. And where it paused, it just says, the subtitle just says, into a fucking spasm of sex interest which that in in the subtitle combined with the expression of like alarm on his face that's really something so this essentially confirms to sigh yeah all right you know what this is probably not a good fit so i'll move on and like honestly Sai hasn't got anybody that he can rely on in this regard. Who else does he have? I, he, other than this is what, Leo? He's got the bartender, whose name I forget. Uh, Harry, Robert, I don't know. Um, but he doesn't have anybody really that, like, the way that Alice decided to handle this is to kind of try and, like, get him to pretend that is is to get Silas to pretend that he's like open to being what's the word I want seduced away from Al and that's why he's sending a representative instead of meeting with Hurst himself it's a combo he wants to do this because he wants to kind of set Hurst up but he's also doing this because he wants to not ever have to be in the same room with this fucking man again and Al can do that because he knows that Silas is intelligent. And is Silas like, 
up to Hearst's standards? Maybe not. He seems a little thrown when we finally see him in this meeting later. He doesn't quite know how to respond to some of the ways that Hearst is deciding to handle him. At the same time, he is miles and miles ahead of Leon or Stapleton. So what are you going to do? Um, but yeah, this scene with him, uh, Silas, I don't know if, if it's his fault or not, like, because it starts right out of the gate with Silas denying something that I feel like maybe he shouldn't deny. Because Hurst says, it seems like Al and Cy have an uneasy alliance. And Silas says, I wouldn't know, sir. And I don't know why he would say. And that seems to be the thing that like makes Hurst stop and look at him. Like, are you full of shit or what? Because of course he would know. I mean, anybody in town knows that they have an uneasy alliance. That doesn't have to mean against Hurst, which is what I feel like he's taking it to mean when Hurst says it. I think it could just mean within the camp, they have had to work together. I mean, they have. You can say that and that's not going to necessarily mean anything. So maybe Silas is just being really cautious, but I feel like the caution comes across as more deceptive than just being like, yeah, I mean, they've had to work together for a long time and like kind of answering him as if you are completely being completely open with him, but simply misunderstanding his meaning. I think that might be the way to go. But I don't know. I, I'm not an expert in this kind of skullduggery. Um, and, you know, Hearst at this point says that just seems like you are lying to me that you don't know anything. Um, what is it that he says? That feels to me less than a full verity. I don't know what that means, Mr. Hurst. That you, not knowing about any uneasiness between Tolliver and Swearingen, sounds to me like a lie. And Silas says, yeah, I guess so. And he says, better. Meanwhile, the captain is standing behind him, just glaring at him. And Silas then says, would you want me saying my first loyalty was to you, Mr. Hurst, or to Verity, instead of Mr. Swearingen? That'd sound like a lie, too, and peg me a liar in the bargain. Uh, and Hurst says, so I'll have to win you away. And he says, I guess so. But I oughtn't to imagine the process will be quick. Guess not. And he just not, like nods and says, did he coach you long? He didn't coach me at all, Hurst. Yeah, all right. Hurst is no dummy. He gives him a long look. I appreciate it a lot that Silas does not break eye contact. Little things like that. I feel like people underestimate how much of an effect they can have because I really, I have to guarantee Hearst is not somebody who is used to an underling like Silas maintaining eye contact with him for any given period. He's just not going to expect this sort of like, I was going to say insolence, but that feels like too strong a word, but I'm sure he interprets it as insolence. I don't think he expected it. And I like the fact that Silas does this without any aggression in his face. His eyes are hooded like he's almost asleep the way that he does it. Um, so finally, he calls to Captain Turner to walk up. And Turner says, go tell your friend. I know he's afraid of me. And Silas pretends not to know who he means and says, Doherty, big guy. And the captain says, I guess he looks big to you. And I had to laugh at that. Is that what you brought me here for? You want me to take that back to Doherty? And Hearst says, I guess so. Because he's fucking with him a little bit. Silas thought that this was like 
going to be a genuine like meeting that he was really going to be able to pull one over and pretend that he's like really, you know, just kind of mercenary and doesn't have any loyalty or, and it turns out they know very well that he's way close to Swearingen, that he's not going to be pulled away and they're not going to bother with that. They just want him to be a messenger, which is like low key insulting. Um, all right. So guys, we go, I, I'm so irritated right now. Let's just talk about what is going on with this livery real quick, because I'm going to get back to this fight, but I want to get this out of the way because it makes me so angry. So I didn't even realize when we were talking, you know, when I, when I said in the last episode last week, just have them get together and sign it at the same time. No, we're not going to have them get together. We're going to have them in totally separate places. And we're going to shoot a gun off to let them know when to sign. That's going to be like the signal. That's ridiculous. That's insane. The fact that they need to do something this elaborate and foolish because the two of these guys will not put their pride to the side. What winds up happening later is deeply upsetting. And I really don't know. I don't know what to do with it. But in this scene here, we've got the general, we've got Aunt Lou, um, and they're like screwing around talking about the livery. She's like, uh, beating a carpet and he's eating some of her food and they're just talking. And then we go really quickly over to Steve, Steve, the drunk who, uh, is washing his face in preparation for this like big moment in his day. And can I just say Tom Nuttall lays into him and is just like, you are just so, you are so much trouble you are embarrassing yourself. You're making my establishment look bad. You've got no fucking self-respect. And as he's saying it, everybody around, because they're the they're in the back area where all of the Chinese are. And Tom is like basically reprimanding him in front of everybody. And all the Chinese turn and look. And it's very clear that Steve is like embarrassed at the fact that he has been reprimanded in front of these people and starts yelling slurs at them. And can I just say the look on Tom Nuttall's face when he realizes that this fucking guy, he has tried so hard to get along with him, has tried to talk some goddamn sense into him, that this guy is still going to go off like this for no fucking reason. Tom Nuttall is low key one of my favorite people on this show right now, just by virtue of his reaction to this whole thing. I appreciate him and how I, I, I know nobody can stand Steve. I get that. And that's totally legit and fair, but the way that he reacts specifically to Steve yelling slurs like this, it makes me feel like, not necessarily that Tom isn't racist, because if you're white in this era, you're racist. I mean, that's just kind of like almost a guarantee. But more that he is shocked by the quality of the language, in addition to the usage of slurs, like the whole, the whole, his sensibilities are offended, is the vibe that I get. And I appreciate that. Um... What winds up happening is that these two dudes sign their fucking contracts separately after a split second of Hostetler hesitating enough that I really wondered if maybe he wasn't going to do it after all. And when they get together to get the loan at the bank, everything seems to be okay. But the moment when Steve assures Alma that he's not going to be shaking Hostetler's hand 
and the look of absolute disapproval that comes at him from every angle. Everybody in that room is looking at him like, you are such a piece of trash. You can see the shame, but the shame manifests not in him reflecting on his actions. It doesn't manifest in him reevaluating how he thinks of Hostetler or maybe that this attitude that he has is giving him a bad name. No, it manifests in him yelling at Hostetler that if he's really a man, he'll give the, he'll give him back the board before he takes off. And by that board, he means the chalkboard that he signed where when they found him jerking off on the back of uh, I think it was Seth's horse, right? It was Seth's. So they made him sign something saying that he fucked a horse so that they wouldn't like tell Seth about it. Basically as insurance to keep this guy from fucking messing with their lives any further. And he wants this chalkboard back. And it's amazing to me that he cares at all. Like it's completely on brand for his character because Steve is nothing if not incredibly self-conscious Steve is one of the most insecure characters I've ever seen on television. And that is really saying something. And his insecurity manifests in all kinds of ways. But it's all like racism is really the easiest one. That's his fallback. And this thing with the horse, like, first of all, when he signed it and they did it all in chalk, I was like, that's a real weird way to do this. Just do it on a piece of paper. Like I didn't see this lasting. Well, it turns out it didn't because I think the general says he hid the chalkboard while he was drunk. So it takes a while for them to even find it. And then once they do shockingly covering it in a piece of like fabric that's porous and burying it somewhere that is not really protected from damp or anything, the writing has come off. And of course, Steve determines that this is a, like, basically he, he insinuates that they plan this all along and planted, excuse me, planted a, a dummy board, like that they were going to use to try and bamboozle him so they could hold on to the other board, which just the amount of thought that he thinks they've given this, Something that's really unimportant that I think they had actually forgotten about, to be honest, but has obviously been preying on his mind for whatever reason. It's embarrassing. So he starts yelling that Hostetler is like trying to swindle him and just gets really aggressive. And Hostetler like kind of loses it. And I didn't expect this to go the way it went. I really, in that first moment when Hostetler is like ready to yank his own face off, his frustration there and and yelling, I am not a liar and you need to fucking stop it with this. I really sympathized with all of his body language and his posture in that moment because the frustration and in, how infuriated and insulted he is and how this dude is not somebody that you can reason with. It's not like we can talk to him in, in a normal way and be like, what you think happened is not what's happening. That's, this is not somebody you can be reasoned with. He will literally camp out in this livery for months and not leave for the mere principle of the thing. Like this guy, ugh, I hate him so much. So, Hostetler, out of sheer frustration and rage and feeling like he's stuck, I guess, goes into the next room and it's barely like five seconds and you hear a gunshot and then it's quiet and they look in there and he's apparently shot himself in the head. 
I'm super bummed about this, you guys. Like, I don't, I can't say that I fully understand exactly what went through his mind here. But it's just so sad to me that he genuinely felt like there was absolutely no way out for him. And Seth tried so, so hard to get this to work out. He put so much energy into doing this because he thought it was the right thing to do for William. That William, like, honoring William's memory by making sure that these two men who were at each other's throats after what happened to him are able to come to a peaceable agreement that is beneficial to both parties and move on with their lives. This was important to him. And like to have it end this way. It's just, it's really, it's a bummer. I will not be called a fucking liar. I didn't live my life for that. Um, yeah, it's guys, I just, I mean, nobody expected this when the, when the shot rings out, Steve turns looking really like, wait, what the fuck? Seth does also, but he seems to like have a suspicion of what it is. The general, on the other hand, immediately looks like he knows what the fuck is going on. And I just, I feel so bad. And I wonder what's going to happen with this money. Like, I guess it's the generals. Like, was he technically in business with Hostetler? I feel like Steve is the kind of person that will lose not a moment trying to act like now that Hostetler's dead, he shouldn't even have to pay for the livery, that it should just be his. But we don't see that far into this episode. So, all right. That's that. Let's talk about Alma. Guys. Everybody can tell something is up with Alma. Everybody can see that she's acting weird. Not not weird enough for most of most people who aren't aware of what she's dealing with to know exactly what it is. They can't put their finger on it, but those of us who know I'm super bummed. Like, I can't, because, and, and I, this is something that I, I I have very mixed feelings on. So, um, the way that they decided to do this was that there's not exactly a given moment where you see Alma struggling like to resist her addiction and then she comes out on top and everything, you know, like there's no moments that we, the only thing that we get in that regard is what she tells doc, which is that she got rid of his medicine because she was worried about it, which I can't help but wonder now if that's even true or not. And there are, addiction is such a tricky fucking thing that part of me wants there to be a catalyst for her suddenly deciding to pick this up again. Like it would, it would be a nice neat thing for me to cling to that. Oh, obviously after X, Y, Z happened, she decided that she was going to start this again. The only thing that I can think is that it might be the loss of the baby but I'm not even sure about that. And there doesn't have to be a catalyst when it comes to addiction. We usually see it portrayed that way in media because it's a nice, neat storytelling device. And it's also a nice, neat thing for us to like pretend to ourselves that if an addict doesn't have a catalyst, they'll just be able to stay clean. And then 
you know, as long as they're not unduly upset or affected by some kind of tragedy or whatever, then it's not, not going to be a problem for them. However, that's not how it actually works. If you are an addict, you are going to be struggling all the time with your addiction, whether there's a particular moment in your, in your life that is harder than usual or not, that's always going to be on your mind. And the fact that there doesn't seem to be a catalyst causing her to go back to this makes sense in its way. It's almost like she, like, I, I can't help but wonder about losing the baby and also her marriage being a sham for a baby that she hasn't gotten to have. I feel like she must feel really trapped and that has to be a factor because it really seemed like she was using opium when she was with uh, Brahm and similar situation. She was in a, in a marriage. It wasn't like she didn't like the guy at all. But it was really clear that, like, she was, she so far outmatched him in terms of intelligence and that the marriage was one of, of necessity for her family. So marriages of necessity are going to feel like prisons. And I guess that the necessity, having been to cover for the raising of an illegitimate child would be it like that child being taken out of the equation and not even getting that a child, which she really wanted by the way, not only because it was Seth's child, but because she just didn't think she could get pregnant and didn't think she'd be able to have a child. It was something that she wanted so much. And I really like, I'm super bummed about the fact that she's back on this guys. I understand it to a degree because the situation that she's in overall is just so difficult. Um, and El Ellsworth is a really good guy, but this whole vibe between them, that chemistry isn't there. And I kind of appreciate that the show hasn't tried to like go in that direction with the two of them and act like, Oh yeah, you know what? We're just going to have it that they actually do have real affection for each other. And that this goes from a marriage of necessity to a marriage of genuine affection. That is something that can certainly happen. And I'm not saying that I don't think they have affection for each other, but it certainly doesn't feel sexual between them. And considering the way that Ellsworth reacts later in this episode, I have to say I'm kind of pleased at the, the, what feels like the revelation that he doesn't even really want this, you know, like I think there's been an assumption that I haven't even known was there that I had, which was he wants to sleep with her, but he knows that that's not where she's at. And so he's not going to even like press that point. He's not going to like hint it. He doesn't want to put any sort of pressure on her at all. So he is going to keep himself at a far remove. But when she starts to come on him, he is not really receptive. She has to throw herself at him. And it isn't until he sees pretty clearly that she is obviously high or on something. I don't know how much he knows about her addiction in the past, but he can tell from the way she's behaving that she's not sober. And he says that he's going to make some arrangements and leave. And he almost says that he's going to take Sophia with him. He finally like, she's like, I can pick her up, but it's really clear she doesn't understand why he's reacting this way. She expected him, I think the same way that I did, to be very receptive to this, to have wanted this and not wanted to say anything about it. And it appears that we were both quite wrong. He, he She has to kind of talk him into it in the first place. He only 
grudgingly starts to go along with it after she really pushes it. And the instant that he realizes that she may not be in control of her own faculties, he's like disgusted. It's not even just, oh, we can't do this. It wouldn't be right. He recoils from her like he's been repulsed. It's serious. And I don't know if that's because he knows her history and he's so disappointed in her. I don't know if he has some personal issue with this drug or, or you know, having had a loved one that was like a huge addict and he has a stronger reaction to it than a lot of people. But whatever the case, it's a really sudden noticeable about face that she seems completely baffled by. I just think she figured Ellsworth was as shitty as so many dudes are where if they're going to get laid, they don't care if the girl is drunk. They don't care if the girl is stoned. They just are excited that, she, you know, she wants to bang and that's enough. And it's not simple enough. Like he just can't get on board, you know, and I really respect that. I really, really do. There's not a lot of dudes even today that would hesitate. And back in that era, forget it. Absolutely. Like, so Ellsworth, I am hoping that his reaction to her and her realizing that she has shown her hand is going to prompt her to try and go back into detox again. But the detoxing was really hard on her. That was a tough thing to watch, never mind to go through. And I am not sure that she's going to be willing to put herself through that again. The only other person that it seems is aware of what she's going through is Trixie. Because we have this interview that Merrick does with her. And she gives this like really over the top sort of leading interview. Like he's supposed to be asking her questions, but really she's asking him all kinds of leading stuff like, um, don't you think that it's safer to bank with us than to bank with the banks in the East that are having all of these troubles lately? Don't you think that a bank that's backed by gold only two miles outside of this very building is a more reliable bank than a place that's, you know, like just the whole thing is so verbose and over the top that Merrick is obviously a little taken aback by that. And later on when he like prints it up and he's looking at it and he's like, you know, this sounded way better when she said it. And now that I'm reading it, I'm like, maybe this isn't actually that smart. And I totally love that moment because there are some people that are so charismatic that they can trick you into thinking they're talking good sense. And then you stop later and think about it and you're like, Oh my God, that was nonsense from beginning to end. And it's not like what she said was nonsense, but it definitely does have this like rehearsed advertisement sort of vibe and feels a little bit heavy handed. But as she's talking to him, he seems clearly to be like ill at ease. He can sense something's going on, but he doesn't know what it is. He gets up and leaves. She leans back in her chair with a slow breath, blinking, licking her lips, shrugging her shoulders. She gives like a, mm, and sort of flexes her fingers and is looking around and smiles to herself. And then she looks over at Trixie and Trixie is staring at her and is like, Oh, really? And Alma realizes that she made a boo-boo. Trixie's no fool. She knows what this shit looks like. And she kind of like leans forward and tries to get control of herself again. But it's too late. Trixie saw that shit. Don't be crazy. Um. All right. So, and we see her when she gets high later and like goes to his door, like the whole thing. And as she's doing this with uh, Ellsworth... We have the scene with Trixie coming into Saul's room. She had said how she wasn't going to be going through this like secret passage, but she lied. She totally is. She's staying in the next building. He bangs on the wall. She comes through and at, she's just basically like she does that thing that Trixie does where she yells really uh 
incoherent, disjointed, out of context stuff that she thinks this other person that she's talking to is supposed to just understand, even though she absolutely gave them no indication who or what she's referring to. So she comes into the room and she's like, first of all, yelling at Saul because he keeps banging on the door and she thought that he would get the point that if she hasn't come over by now, even though he's banged on the wall a bunch of times, then either she's not here or she doesn't want to fucking see him, but he won't let up. So she finally comes in and what is it that she says? She comes in, she yells, what? He says, hello. She says, you fucking work at the bank. He says, I do now. Not a noble hello at opening and regal fucking look by at the closing up of shop. I'm at the hardware store all day, Trixie. And she says, I'll switch with you. Banks a Jew's proper province anyways, along with the addled self-deceived. And he says, our depositors? And she says, the bank's founder and president, chief officer, as well of airheaded smugness and headlong plunges unawares into the fucking abyss. And he says, I don't understand. And she says, you wouldn't. You're too fucking healthy minded. And finally, she just says, do you want to get fucked or not? And he says, yes, please. And that's the end of the scene. So, yeah, she's like yelling at him about this whole thing. And she can't even like tell him what the fuck she's talking about. Trixie, you are such a weirdo. I really enjoy her, though. Like, I really do. She's not even talking. She's not trying to talk to him. She's trying to have a conversation with herself. Um, so, yeah, the whole way that this goes with with her watching Alma and noticing this, I have no idea how she's going to handle this. I want her to yell at her, but Alma is so snobbish when she gets defensive and so sort of, I mean, her pride is not going to stand for, it's not just that she is an addict, but it's the fact that she fucked up once already and got back on the wagon and now has fallen off again. And that I feel like is something that she won't be able to abide somebody having seen in her. Um, I just don't, I don't know. And Trixie, I feel like is going to have to know to a point you have to let go of the fact that somebody is a, an addict and is responsible for their own choices. So I don't know how much she's going to try to help Alma again or get her to see the light or say anything. She may feel like I tried and this woman is determined to do what she wants to do. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I'm and Ellsworth, like when he says, I'll make some arrangement for my things and the like arrange to collect my things. Like, is he saying that he's going to divorce her? Is that, I don't, I don't really know what it is that he is saying. If it's just that he realizes if she needs to be high to sleep with him, that she's that unhappy and that he wants to like separate because he knows that their marriage was one of convenience and that she doesn't need him anymore. Um, but it like I don't feel like he's going to say anything about the drug use, but he may to the doc. I I don't know. I'm I'm curious though. I if either of them are going to say anything to anybody, you know. Anyway, all right. So I'm going to back up and we'll talk about this fucking fight because this is the thing, right? Um <laughs> So things start off pretty bad. When they find yet another Cornishman in the street who has been stabbed in the heart. And I have to say, Merrick taking off his jacket to cover up this poor man is a really sweet moment where it's just so, like, respectful and, and sensitive. It's not necessary, but I really love that character moment. 
And this dude was left in the middle of the thoroughfare on purpose, clearly, to kind of try and provoke. Um, oh, you know what? I said that nobody else knows about her drug use, but I lied because Leon is the one supplying her and he goes and tells Sai. That's no good. I forgot all about that. Mm, okay, that's that's adding a wrinkle. Fuck, I forgot about that. Um, but sorry, I'm getting off off track here. But the thing is that essentially Hurst wants Seth to know about the fact that he has killed another guy because he's essentially poking him in the eye. Just being like, yeah, what are you going to do about it? No, we totally killed another organizer. I don't know anything about it, of course. The fact that he was an organizer, I don't think is even relevant information. And who knows who did it? Could have been anybody. But it's definitely fitting the pattern. Hmm. Interesting. Seth comes in to fucking talk to Al, who is sitting with all of his guys. And Seth is like, I am going to arrest this motherfucker. I'm going to do it. I am sick and tired of this. Al is like, oh, my God. Between you and Dan, I can't handle this. You both need to get a hold of yourself. And I withdraw from our agreement. Al says, I'd ask. It's a very brief extension. Seth says, no, no. Or we're both just fucking cowards. And that gets Al and he stands up. I ain't no fucking coward, though Dan might support your decision. And Dan is sitting there, literally tears in his eyes of frustration because he wants to fight so bad. And Al can't decide what fucking trick it is that Hearst is trying to play here by getting these two to fight. And because he doesn't understand the angle, he doesn't want to let Dan do it because he feels like there's got to be some fucking ulterior motive or some sort of like ace up their sleeve or something else going on. It turns out really all it is. Hearst wants to to run things and intimidate everybody and having his second in command guy beat the shit out of somebody and kill them in the thoroughfare in public in broad daylight is a pretty fucking good intimidation tactic. And he calls it, I think at some point, like an object lesson, which considering that his man is killed in the end is beautiful. But yeah, this dude is over here, like goading everybody. And Al knows that's what he's doing And assigns it a little bit too much. He he tries to divine subtler intentions than are actually there. It's actually pretty straightforward and basic what's going on here. Um and there's a moment as they're all like discussing this, after Seth agrees that he's gonna continue to wait according to Al's instructions. E.B. comes in and they're all really like not friendly to him and not that anybody's ever really liked E.B. But he says something I miss our morning coffee. So they're clearly like avoiding him in a way that they hadn't been before. And then he says, it's not my fault that he bought the hotel. I didn't sell it to him willingly. He strong armed me into it. And I didn't even think about the social implications of him doing this deal. But He's not lying. Like, we saw it. He did not want to sell. He didn't want to sell to anybody. And the fact that he is being shunned because of it just strikes him as, like, such so deeply unfair. And to a point, I have to agree. Like, it's not his fault. It's not... It's not anybody's fault when they get in Hearst's path that they have to do something that's, like, unsavory or embarrassing or humiliating that's just what how this guy works otherwise you just wind up dead it seems like um all right so al says finally go ahead and fight him it's past me i can't figure it out go ahead so we have this scene of dan getting ready for the fight he's doing the thing that 
is like a joke amongst a lot of people of putting Vaseline on. I don't know how many of you have encountered this, but uh, it's supposed to be like a thing that, you know, brawlers, uh, especially when we're talking about like women taking their earrings out, putting their hair back in ponytails and covering themselves in Vaseline so that it's harder to grip onto you or that if you get punched, it like glances off more easily. Um and he is, I think it's bear grease that he's probably using, but it's nasty. And Johnny offers to Dan, thinking that he's doing something good that a friend would want. And I really appreciate Johnny because it's Johnny may be kind of stupid sometimes, but he's not as dumb as I thought initially. And it seems like he's really willing to listen and learn, which is more than I can say for a lot of people. And this moment where Dan starts yelling at him, you can see that Johnny is upset that he misunderstood so much, but he doesn't even seem to take it that personally, how Dan is yelling at him. He seems more like, okay, I had this all wrong. Like frustrated with himself that he didn't really get it. Because what Johnny offers is that if things start to go bad, that Dan can make basically say a word that they agree on to signal and Johnny will blow this guy's head off. And to Dan, that is the height of not just cowardice, but just like dishonorable. The idea that not only does this guy think that he has such a good, like good chance of losing that he'd be standing on the sidelines with a gun, but also the fact that like, if I'm on the edge of losing, and you shoot the guy. How is that going to look to everybody? Yeah, I'll still be alive, but I'll be fucking shamed. And everybody's going to know that I'm still alive because somebody else did something kind of shady. And I don't want that. That's not, you know. And Johnny, the way that he phrases it is like if things start to go wrong. And Dan says plenty of things have started to go wrong. And then turned out all right. I am not going to deal with like every time something starts to go wrong, having somebody jump in and fix it for me and pull my ass out of the fire. If things look like they're starting to go wrong, maybe they are, maybe they're not, but you better stay in your goddamn lane. So they have this, moment staring at one another across the thoroughfare as the like horses and uh, c carriages and wagons rattle by. They both take off their belts that have like their knives and guns on them. And then they just run at each other like a couple of fucking bears. And it's very high energy for about four or five minutes and then the two of them start to get really, really tired. And I have to say that there was a moment when Johnny says something about how um, the captain was going to have a jump on, on Dan because the captain has short hair and Dan won't be able to grab it, but the captain will sure be able to grab onto his hair. And he turns and looks at Johnny in such a way, and it's obvious that he's like, horrified at even the suggestion that he cut his hair. But I was kind of hoping that even though he was horrified by the suggestion that he would realize how like true it was and maybe do it anyway. And we'd see him walk out shockingly with short hair, but that is not what happened. He leaves it. Not only does he leave it long, he doesn't even tie it back, which I was really surprised by. Um, so everybody is standing outside watching these two and they're fucking rolling around, getting into everybody's different stands. Like there's a campfire set up because somebody's cooking stuff or smoking stuff and they like roll right into it. The whole thing is quite a spectacle. And there comes a point finally where the captain drags Dan over to a puddle and holds his head down in it. And it really looks like that's it. It really looks like Dan is about to die. And you see he, when the captain does this. He looks up at Hurst like he's waiting for him to signal, yeah, all right, let this guy die. But Hurst doesn't respond. He's just watching. And you can see the captain being a little bit unsure, like he thought that this would be the moment 
And for some reason, his boss is not giving him the go ahead that he expected. And that's when Dan overturns him and is able to get up. Al, meanwhile, had his head bowed because you can see he really thought his friend was dead. But no. So then Dan manages to get up. He's crawling away. The captain is crawling after him. Like the two of them are so fucking tired and beat up. The captain keeps grabbing his ankles and he just yanks his ankles out of the guy's grasp. He turns Dan over and bashes his head a couple times into a rock that's sitting at like in a ring for a fire. And this is when Dan reaches up and pulls the man's fucking eyeball out of its socket. Y'all, couple things. First of all, this effect of his eye hanging out of his socket is a little bit too good. It looks quite real. I've never actually seen anybody with their eyeball hanging out of their socket, but I imagine that this is accurate. But more than that, the actor who is playing the captain, his screams are very convincing. There is something that there is a phenomenon that I like to call the man scream. And that is something that when an actor is too self-conscious about his screaming because he is a male and he feels like he needs to have a strong manly scream, that it can sound very affected and, and silly and not actually like real pain or real fear. It sounds like somebody putting on an affectation the captain does not do that the captain just goes <laughs> it's like this high pitched coming from his gut oh my god i am watching my eyeball hang out of my face i can't believe this is happening sort of moment it's pretty brutal it's pretty brutal dan smacks him hard in the back with a piece of firewood and has to like bend over and almost throw up right after doing it. Cause he's so exhausted. He turns and looks at Hearst who just stares back at him. And then he looks at Al and Al gives him a nod that is so slight. It's almost not even there. And he gets that log and he bashes the captain in the head until he's dead. And it really takes a minute. Like this is a, this is this whole scene and the way that Dan looks down at him. It's like, this is part of the ritual. He has to do it. He has to actually kill the guy, but he doesn't enjoy this moment the way that you'd expect because it is genuinely pretty fucking brutal. And he turns and walks inside and you see Hearst just look at him like he just didn't expect this. Hearst did not expect this. And I am delighted. Um, and in the end, Seth, who is incensed over what the fuck happened with Hostetler, Decides that he is going to take that out on somebody else, as is his want. Seth's favorite thing is to redirect anger from one thing to somebody else. And he goes into Sai's place where Hurst is having a drink because he's sad that his friend is dead. And Seth walks in and provokes him into, quote, threatening him and arrests him for threatening a peace officer. And I don't know what he's doing here. But frankly, I don't care. It was great. And I just need this man to be taken down by like several pegs. And I'm eager to find out what the fuck Seth's planning on doing here. Um, so, yeah. <sighs> Packed episode. There's also a whole other thing with this old man arriving who is working with Jack and the theater troupe. And they're like distributing titles and committee head and, and all this stuff. I'm not going to get into that because that didn't really interest me and I don't get it so far. But uh, I I will be curious to see where that all goes. Like, I like Jack as a character, and I think it was smart for them to bring Jack in as somebody who was old friends with Al. But I don't know that this whole new cast of characters that they're pulling in at this point in this last season is necessarily a good idea. 
So I guess we'll see about that. But I did want to mention it because uh, I, you know, it takes up a few different scenes. And this old guy, Jack is like apparently going to make sure that he's able to continue to participate in stuff, even though he's basically completely bedridden. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, oh, this starts a lot of stuff. I'm very curious what's happening with Hearst next episode. I don't know what Seth has planned. I don't know if he made a plan. He might not have, but he's just so angry. He needed to do something. And I really get that. <sighs> wow. All right. Well, guys, I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you again to Patrick for commissioning this episode. Really appreciate it. Hope that you guys have been enjoying the coverage. And I will be seeing you again soon with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. <laughs>